Well, when my middle sister's oldest daughter was a toddler, my wife and I, we would have quiet conversation alone about how she wasn't very well disciplined. She, she wasn't a good child. She would pull things off tables. She'd pull things off shelves. She colored with crayons and markers on the walls. And we were pretty convinced it was poor discipline by my sister. They just weren't doing a very good job. We already had three kids at that point in time. Our kids would never do that. They would never color on the walls because well-disciplined kids don't do that. They wouldn't, we didn't have to put stuff up high because our kids knew better than to pull stuff off tables or shelves. And then along came our fourth, Taylor, who colored on walls, <laughs> pulled stuff down, and we were suddenly confronted with the reality that we weren't as good a parents as we thought we were. And I'm glad we didn't say anything to my sister about that because we would have been pretty embarrassed when Taylor came along. But if we had have said something to my sister, it would have been something called mom shaming. You guys heard of mom shaming? Yeah, it's like body shaming, except instead of saying negative comments about somebody's body, you're saying negative comments about their parenting skills or their decisions. And if you've never even heard that term, if you're a mom, you probably experienced it at some point in time, so you know what it is. And if you're not a mom or a dad, you don't have any kids, you've probably mom shamed someone else in a restaurant or in line at the store at some point in time. Let me give you an example of mom shaming that happened to my wife. This was a number of years ago. We had taken a vacation as a whole family with all four of us, all four kids, all six of us. Uh, my oldest was about 12. My youngest was about four at the time. And we'd gone out to Southern California, and we were eating dinner in this restaurant. And we were all sitting there. And as we were finishing up, this uh, California couple comes up to us with their one child. And the mom says, pretty, pretty sickly sweet, why would you choose to have four kids? And I looked up immediately and without missing a beat, I said, because we sure didn't want five. <laughs> she, she did not think that was nearly as funny as I did. I thought that was a pretty funny quip, but she was mom shaming my wife for having more kids than she thought was appropriate. So let me ask moms a question. Have you ever been mom shamed? Yeah, a lot of you. Let me ask a question that's going to get even more responses. Have you ever felt mommy guilt? Yeah, that guilt about something, a decision you've made or something that's happened and you feel guilt as a parent. You're not alone. There was actually a survey done by the authors of a book called Mommy Guilt, Learn to Worry Less, Focus on What Matters Most, and Raise Happy Kids. It's based on a survey of over 1,300 parents. And what they found is that 96% of parents have felt significant guilt in their parenting. Not surprisingly, the 4% that didn't feel guilt were dudes. It just was. Dads are like, ah, oh, whatever, you know, we're good. Actually, there was only one mom in the entire survey that said she had not experienced significant guilt. I'm thinking either she checked the wrong box when it came to the guilt question, or she was actually a dad that checked the wrong box there. But I also did my own unscientific study a few weeks ago. About three weeks ago, I posted something on Facebook and asked the question about what makes you feel inadequate as a mom. And I got all these different responses, very quickly got a bunch of responses, and there were a lot of different things that made people feel guilty in their, in their parenting, but no matter what it was, it caused you to feel guilt. And so on this Mother's Day, I want to give moms hopefully the gift of letting go of some of that guilt, because you're probably doing a much better job parenting than you give yourself credit for. As I was thinking about what to preach today on Mother's Day, I, certainly there's a lot of Old Testament stories that I could have focused on. Could have done Adam and Eve. If I would have preached on Adam and Eve and their sons, Cain and Abel, I would have made you feel like parents of the year because unless you've let one of your kids kill their brother, you're doing a great job. But I also thought about all these different stories in the Old Testament with all these dysfunctional and messed up families that would have made you feel like you were up for some award in your parenting. But then again, some of mommy guilt comes from comparison. And so why do we want to make, why do we want to mom shave Eve? She probably already feels bad enough about the whole eating the forbidden fruit, messing up the garden for everybody. So let's not do that. So I thought about where does freedom from guilt come from? And, and, and what I realized is it comes from the same place that forgiveness comes from. It, it comes from Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And the Apostle Paul has written a lot about this theology of forgiveness and being set free from guilt and shame. 
And, and so he wrote this letter to the church in Rome that talked about this theology of forgiveness. And then in Romans uh, 8, 1, he says this incredibly profound truth for us as Christians, but it also has some unique implications for mothers as well. And here's what he says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation, another word for that is judgment. So there is now no judgment, there is no guilt, there is no shame for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven and set free. Now, the primary thing this is talking about is how when Jesus died on the cross, he forgave us of our sins when we follow him so that we become righteous in God's eyes. We have a right relationship with God. That's the primary meaning of this passage of Scripture. But it's actually much bigger than that because Jesus came to do more than just to forgive our sin. He came to forgive the guilt and shame of our sin so that we can live lives to the full. Listen to how he says this in John 10.10. These are Jesus' words here. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. What Jesus is saying is he didn't just die to forgive us of our sin. He died so that we could feel the freedom from guilt and shame. And so what I hope is that as we talk through some of these things, we can not just be free from our past sins, but we can also be free from the guilt and the shame. And so on this Mother's Day, I want to talk about three different areas of mommy guilt that I saw in my Facebook survey. And I want to talk about each one of those and how we can be free from that. The first one is this. There is now no condemnation in the perceptions. One of the things mom said that didn't really surprise me, but it, it should surprise us a little bit, is one of the primary sources of mommy guilt comes from other moms. That doesn't make any sense, but we know that it's true because there is this comparison that we make to how other people are doing. And everybody has an opinion about how you should pa parent. Your parents have opinions about how you should parent. Your siblings with kids have opinions about how you should parent. Your friends with kids have opinions about how you should parent. But my favorite source of great wisdom for parenting is from people that don't yet have kids, because that's the best. When they're giving you some words of advice in the line, they're making fun of you or talking about you in the checkout line in Target because your two-year-old is throwing a fit over a piece of candy. Next time that happens, just turn around when they say discipline your kid and just go, you know, thank you for that. I had never even considered disciplining my two-year-old that's throwing a fit until you said that. That's such great wisdom. In fact, why don't you take them for a couple of months and teach them to be better? That'll shut them up. <laughs> Everybody's got opinions, and they're very serious about their opinions. And it starts even before you give birth. They tell you how much weight you should gain, what nutrients and supplements you should take, how you should exercise, things you should think about. And then, my goodness, when you have a baby, people are telling you how long you should breastfeed, whether or not you should co-sleep or let them sleep alone. Now, if you don't know what co-sleeping is, you clearly have not read enough parenting books. I'm just telling you. But co-sleeping is just a, I guess, a more cultured way of saying, let them sleep in the bed with us. Everybody has an opinion about those things. So you, you look over to the left and someone says, you know, you got to let them cry a while to go to sleep. Don't pick them up. But then you look over here and somebody says, oh, no, 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 no. If you don't pick them up fast, you're, gonna, you're a horrible parent and they're going to be in therapy for the rest of your lives. And everybody's really serious about that. And it doesn't get better when the kids get older because now you've got choices of school. Do we public school? Do we private school? Do we homeschool? And then what curriculum do we choose? How do we do all of those different things? There's, all, there's even mommy guilt about first birthday parties and how much effort and energy you should put into that. Can I get on a soapbox about first birthday parties for just a minute? That little dude does not care how much effort you put into the first <laughs> birthday party. He does not. All he wants is a cake to put his face in. That's all he cares about. And yet we feel guilt about how much effort we put into that. But do you see what I just did? I just mom shamed you if you had a big birthday party. We all do it. Then if in-person judgment and guilt isn't enough, we've got Facebook and Instagram. And so we get to see these perfect families with their perfect moments and their perfectly clean clothes. 
We go out to dinner as a family, and you look at your two-year-old, and they've got spaghetti stains all over their shirt, and so does your husband. (laughs) And you smell like spit-up milk because the baby gave back dinner. And you start to wonder where it went wrong, what mistakes you made. And, And so mommy guilt starts to grow. Then if Facebook and Instagram aren't enough, my goodness, there's Pinterest. Oh, oh, Pinterest that shows us what creative and loving moms do for their kids that we can't do for ours. And so we're confronted with the reality of all the different shapes that we could cut their sandwich into before we send them to preschool. And so we feel guilty about that. And then we feel guilty about sending them to preschool. And we, and we think if only I could be a stay-at-home mom, then I could do everything on Pinterest. I could be the perfect mom. And so guilt starts to increase. But see, that's not what Jesus wants for you. There is now no condemnation that your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches aren't cut into little hearts. There isn't. There's not any condemnation even if you have the crust still on your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Listen to the words of Jesus in John 14, 27. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So take a deep breath. No, really. Take a deep breath and hold it. Now let it out slowly. You're doing a better job than you think you are. We start to think that somehow parenting is a competition sport, that we're competing with other parents, but it's not. What other people are doing is not necessarily what's right for your family. Look, it's okay to read parenting books. It's okay to listen to the advice of other people, but at the end of the day, Make your own decisions and understand that you don't have to do what other people do. Don't get caught in the comparison trap. Here, here's how the comparison trap works. So you, you look over here at all these parents that are doing more than you, and you, you see them on Instagram and Facebook, and they have these amazing families that are doing all these really cool things and have amazing moments, and you start to feel mommy guilt because you're not having those moments or it doesn't feel like you are. And, and so then you look over here, And you kind of mommy guilt the people that don't do as much as you do. So you look over at the worst moms and you mom shame them. And and so you put all these amazing things on Facebook and that causes them to feel mommy guilt. And, And so this circle of comparison is complete. So you try to keep up with the good moms. So you try to have an amazing birthday party for your two year old that's got circus clowns and I don't know, trains and dancing tigers. And you kill yourself, you spend way too much money, and then you post those pictures on Instagram and Facebook so that some other mom goes, well, we didn't have dancing tigers at our party, and they feel bad about it. And that's how this works. You get mom shamed, you feel inadequate, and so then you want to put the perfect pictures out there on Instagram, and and the circle of shaming is complete. But parenting is not a competition sport. It's not. Parents... We need to all band together as parents and remind ourselves who the real enemy is, our kids. (laughs) About seven years ago, my wife and my three younger kids, they went on a trip together and left me and my oldest daughter at the house. And some of you may have actually seen this, but we decided to kind of document our seven days alone. And, And we did it on Pinterest, on Instagram and Facebook, and we used the hashtag Mom's gone, and we modeled it after the reality show Survivor. Some of you guys may actually remember this, but I want to walk you through some of those pictures. So here's the first one. It it says, Survivor Katie, day one, we're home alone. The rest of the family is gone for a week. Hashtag mom's gone. And then day two, euphoria has set in. There are no rules. Day three, supplies are running out, but hope remains. Day four, kicked off the island. (laughs) The difficult conditions have caused discord in the team. Day five, disaster strikes. The team's plan to cook went tragically wrong. Day six, dealing with the consequences. The small fire destroyed their last supplies and forced the team into more primitive shelter to weather out the storm. Day seven, hope restored. (laughs) The team's morale improves with a possible new food source. (laughs) 
Hashtag, no dogs were harmed in the filming of this. Day eight, we survived. Mom came home with presents. After about three days, we had people that were calling and texting and asking us if we needed them to bring us food. <laughs> and we said, hey, look, I'm really not eating crackers with, with syrup on them. After the day of the great fire, we had people that actually came up to us at church after that was over, and some of them thought we'd actually had a fire, and that for some reason I decided to go grab the camera before I grab, grabbed the fire <laughs> extinguisher. Uh, other people thought we actually started the fire to get a good pick. Let me be clear. I'm a better cook than to have a fire, well, that big, <laughs> but I'm also smarter than to start a fire because I know what would happen when my wife gets home. It was a Photoshop. It wasn't real. And the reality is those pictures that you see on Instagram and Facebook of other families aren't much more real than what I just showed you. Because this is a posed moment to show the very best. Don't get caught in the comparison trap. A real home isn't made up of dressed up photo opportunities. It's made up in love and courage and day-to-day -day life. See, I think we can get so caught up in trying to get that perfect moment on Facebook that we miss experiencing that perfect moment. Your family is built on the moments you share with each other, not the moments and the pictures you share on Facebook and Instagram. You don't have to do everything other families do. You don't have to do it the way other families do. You know, the study on mommy guilt that was in that book, do you know that it showed that stay-at-home moms have just as much mom guilt as working moms? So you feeling guilty that you're not super mom that can leak tall accounting records in a single bound and then come home and make a six-course meal every evening? That's not real. You're putting guilt on yourself that you don't need. There is now no condemnation in the perception of others. There's not even any condemnation of the perception you have on yourself by comparison to other moms. All right, here's the second thing. There is now no condemnation in the imperfections. There were moms in my Facebook survey who talked about how they blamed themselves for some of the decisions that their kids had made. Your kids are not going to be perfect. They have free will. No matter what you do, no matter how well you parent, they're going to do dumb things. They're going to do rebellious things. They're even going to sometimes do hateful things that are wrong. A, a friend of ours told us about one of those moments with their four-year-old. She was driving alone with the four-year-old, and he was strapped in the, in the back seat into his little, you know, seat thing. And he kept unbuckling the, the seatbelt off his booster seat and getting out and standing up. And so she would pull over and she would put him back in his booster seat. And the last time she said, if you do it again, I'm going to spank you. And so sure enough, she pulls back out and she's driving down the road. And she looks up and the little dude's dancing in the back seat. So she pulls over and she gives him pretty good spanking, puts him back in his booster seat and tells him not to get out. So she pulls out, she starts driving and she keeps looking up in the mirror to make sure he's minding. And after she does that a couple of times, he sees her looking. And he's angry, and he says, just as mad as he can say from this little booster seat, in my mind, I'm still standing up. <laughs> she didn't teach him to do that. He did that on his own. When my youngest daughter, I mean, when my youngest sister, first daughter was two, we were over at her house, and her daughter was throwing a huge temper tantrum. And my sister was really embarrassed, and she said, you know, she's throwing a tantrum because she didn't get her nap out. I just smiled and I said, no, she's, she's throwing a temper tantrum because she's evil. <laughs> but, but just smile and own it because you can't stop it. And I would tell you the same thing. There is now no condemnation in the mistakes of your kids and their imperfection. Those perfectly behaved kids you see on Instagram and Facebook, they're probably just as rotten as your kids 30 seconds after that picture was taken. See, at the end of the day, all our kids are different. And no matter how we raise them, they're going to make their own choices. We had three kids, no wall coloring. We had a fourth child, wall coloring, like the Sistine Chapel of wall coloring. But you know that little wall colorer is about to turn 19. She has her own faith in Jesus, and she'll finish up at Texas A&M her first year with a 4.0. Yeah, I say that, yeah. I, I say that to say that you're doing better than you think you are. So, I couldn't be more proud of her. I, I think so many moms 
feel guilt every time their kid gets in trouble in school or throws a temper tantrum and starts throwing cinnamon toast crunch all over the aisle at H-E-B. It's like you think you taught them to throw that. You know, you taught them how to do that. You didn't teach them how to do that. They did that on their own. And then you start to feel guilty that you're letting them have cinnamon toast crunch. And all that guilt plays into what you're thinking. But those kids have a mind of their own. And just like you, they were given free will. You know, it's funny to talk about mistakes of a two-year-old when they're throwing cinnamon toast crunch. But it's less fun to talk about the mistakes of a 22-year-old when you feel like they're throwing their life away. Maybe you've got an older child or a grown child that's turned away from their faith in Jesus and you struggle with that. Or maybe they're struggling with drug addiction or they've gotten in trouble with the law and you, you blame yourself for those mistakes that they made. You, you find yourself questioning all the decisions that you made. Maybe you should have had more discipline when they were younger. Maybe you should have had less discipline when they were younger. Maybe you should have recognized it earlier. But the reality is you are not responsible for the choices that they ultimately make. That's their decision. You cannot force them to love Jesus and make the right decisions. There is now no condemnation for the choices your grown child makes. Let's be clear. It, it is your responsibility to train them and to grow them and to teach them to love Jesus. But at the end of the day, they were given free will just like you are. I, I think we make the mistake as preachers. We rely on a passage of Scripture that I'm going to show you. That I think we make the mommy guilt worse and the dad guilt worse because we misuse a particular passage of Scripture. This is Proverbs 22, 6. It says, start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. And so often that's taught as some sort of a promise from God. That's not a promise. That's a principle. All it is is in a book of wisdom. And so what it's saying that if we work hard, we teach our kids to love Jesus, we teach them what it looks like to make right decisions, that the odds go up, that they'll follow Jesus when they're older. The odds go up that they'll make good decisions, but it's not a guarantee. But we look back and we go, man, they made bad decisions, therefore I probably didn't teach them the right things. I didn't teach it in the right way. But that's not what this is. It's wisdom from God, not a promise from God. So you moms that struggle with the imperfection and mistakes of your kids, I tell you to live in those imperfections and find joy in the moments. Enjoy your kids for who they are rather than constantly worrying and stressing about who you want them to be. Pray for them to become the adults you want them to be, but enjoy and find joy in those moments of who they are. Listen how the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Pray for them to make good decisions and be who you want them to be but enjoy them for who they are right now. Take time to enjoy the little things. Just appreciate your daughter. Appreciate her test grade that she's excited about. Appreciate her telling you about her first date. Live in the moment with your son as he's talking about his RBI double in baseball. Live in those moments because they won't last. So I want to give you a couple of tips that I think can really help you focus in on enjoying who they are now and not stressing so much about who you want them to be. First thing is, get rid of electronics at times. Turn the phone off, turn the TV off, and really enjoy relating to your kids. That's something I've had to struggle with. I'll be playing some goofy game, I'll be sitting in my chair and a kid will come talk to me, and I'll talk to them while I'm playing some Candy Crush game. That game will be there, or some bigger game where I get to crush candy with some virtual reality hammer will be there, but my kids will not, and we're already starting to see that. Make a conscious decision to have time without electronics. The, the other thing I would tell you is find moments for intentional conversation. I, I'm a big fan of eating dinner together three or four times a week, even if that means ordering pizza and just sitting together at the table. Find moments for intentional conversation. Our family, will, when, we were, when they were younger, we'd sit in the living room and we'd talk about Scripture or we'd talk about some verse that we were memorizing or we'd talk about some exciting event that's coming up or a vacation we took and we'd just take time to really enjoy being with one another. But make sure in those moments that the cell phones and iPads and all are in a different room so that you can have intentional conversation. If you don't know what to talk about as a family, just Google family conversation starters. You'll get lots of ideas for what you can talk about. Your family isn't perfect. 
It never will be. But it's yours. It's yours to love. It's yours to grow. It's yours to teach. It is a gift you've been given. Your family is held together by the love you have for one another, even with all your faults and imperfections. There's now no condemnation in perceptions. There's now no condemnations in imperfections. And here's the last one. And I believe it's the most difficult for you to accept and embrace. There is now no condemnation in your past mistakes. Some of the women in my survey on Facebook, they continued to blame themselves for mistakes that they'd made when their kids were younger, things they didn't do or should have done. And look, we all struggle with that because we've all made mistakes. We've all made mistakes in our life. We've all made mistakes in our parenting. And so we can struggle with the guilt and the shame of that. And, and for you, maybe the mistakes are just little mistakes you've made along the way, but the guilt still nags at you. Or, or maybe you made some big mistakes, and you just can't get past the guilt and the shame. The reality is, Jesus didn't just come to forgive your sins. He for, came to take away your guilt and your shame. We beat ourselves up, and we start to believe that all our kids' problems are the result of our mistakes. We can start to feel that we're not worthy. We can even start to feel that God is thinking about us, how we view ourselves. But that could not be further from the truth. Jesus came to set you free from the guilt and the shame of that mistakes and sin. He didn't intend you to be weighed down and live the rest of your life with those mistakes. One of my favorite psalms or poems in the Old Testament is written by King David. And if you don't know much about King David, I'll give you the very short version of, of this story. He was one of the great kings of the Old Testament, Israel. But he made one of the biggest mistakes that really you can make. He sinned with Bathsheba, and you've probably heard that name. But um, he had committed adultery with another man's wife. And then to try to cover that sin up, he had that other man killed. So now on his resume, he's got adultery and murder. And so David is living with that. But then he's forgiven by God. He repents of his sin. He's forgiven by God. And he writes this beautiful psalm or this poem. I want to read it to you. This is in Psalm 32, 5. It says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. That's what's so amazing about what God does. He, he doesn't just forgive the sin. He wants to take the, the guilt and the shame. He doesn't want to leave you with that struggle. Maybe you were in a marriage that ended in divorce. That, that was years ago, but you just still struggle with the mistakes and the sin that you made in the, that process. And, and you worry about how it affected your kids. Maybe you had an abortion and you just can't get past the guilt and the shame. You've got other kids now, but it just doesn't seem to make up for the one that you lost. Or, or maybe you started following Jesus later in life and some of your kids don't follow Jesus. And you blame yourself for that, those past mistakes. I don't know what you've done that causes you to struggle with guilt, but I do know this. Jesus' grace is greater than your guilt. Psalm 32, 5 was written just for you. God doesn't just forgive the sin. He wants to take away the guilt and the shame. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've received grace. Grace from the sin, grace from the shame. You've been set free. You've been t the condemnation has been taken away. See, what Jesus came to do was to take things that are broken and messed up and ugly and to make them beautiful again. But, but you've got to choose to live in that grace. You, you've got to choose to forgive yourself. You are a daughter of the king. You are forgiven. Live in the freedom of the present, not the guilt of your past mistakes. See, no matter how much you feel guilty and shame and regret, you can't go back and change what's already happened. But you can be free in the present from the guilt and the shame. There is now no condemnation for perceptions. There is now no condemnation for imperfections. And there is now no condemnation for your past mistakes. Moms, I've made a little list of things to kind of wrap up on that there's now no condemnation for. There's no condemnation for not doing everything on Pinterest. There's not even condemnation if you hate Pinterest with a white-hot passion. 
There's no condemnation for not having a desire to homeschool or to foster or to adopt. No condemnation for your miscarriage. No condemnation for not parenting just like your mom did. No condemnation for being a working mom or a busy mom. There's no condemnation for not being able to get pregnant or to breastfeed or to be at every school event like some other moms. There's no condemnation for your abortion or your divorce or the sin from your past. No condemnation for a messy home. No condemnation for finding it easier to love one child than another. No condemnation that you can't cook. No condemnation that your kids' lunch sandwiches don't look like little Star Wars characters. No condemnation because your kids have rebelled against what you believe. No condemnation that you don't use organic produce or essential oils or that your kids write on the walls. You are a daughter of the king and there is now no condemnation. Let's pray.